Come on now. How we feeling today? We feeling good? Man, we're so great. I'll tell you what, I just, this whole week, I, uh, first of all, if we're just meeting, my name is Pastor Mike O'Connell. We're so thankful that you're here. And um, here's what I know is that maybe you haven't experienced an environment like that, and that's okay. Here's what I know, though, is that um, I believe that when you're in the presence of God, something is, is stirred up in your heart. You know, eternity is in our hearts. And, uh, and so we're just so thankful that you're here. Wherever you're at in the journey, you could be really far from Jesus, and we're thankful that you're in the room today. It really means a lot to us that you're here. We'd love to meet you afterwards, out the middle doors, uh, by the new here sign. Also, man, thank you to everybody that's tuning in all over the world. We're so grateful for Pastor Cap's leadership and the entire team that is ministering to the community online. It's, uh, it's really a beautiful thing. But I just, I just know, um, man, in, in, this, in this season of my life, as I've just kind of been reflecting, it's about 12 years ago in the month of July that I left Southern California to just come here and begin serving God and studying his word. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I love Jesus' church. I love the church. And um, you know, it's just in culture right now, you're hearing uh, a lot of people poo-poo the local church. I don't need the church. I can just kind of walk with you. Here's what I know. Jesus said he's gonna build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you're looking for a perfect church, this isn't it. I, I'm not perfect, I know that much. And the church will never be perfect because it's full of a bunch of humans that are in process. But what unifies us is the perfect one. Is anybody with me today? And so in this hour, I don't know about you, but I'm committing myself to building the one thing that Jesus said he was gonna build. No matter what it costs, no matter the sacrifice, and uh, I just think about, here's what I know, and I just, this isn't even a part of my message, but I just feel like I need to share this because we're seeing it in culture. I mean, my goodness, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, I mean, come on, the mockery of the Last Supper. And uh, it's just, it's, we're living in some interesting days and casual Christianity is over. Like you gotta figure out where you stand. And it's time to stop being lukewarm and just, coming into church with our lattes and walking out and not thinking about Jesus the rest of the week. But this is, the, he needs some wartime Christians, some people that are ready to put on the armor of God and step up in this hour. Are you with me today? If you're not, I'm praying that your spirit is waking up and it's not to go out into culture and be prideful and say that we have it figured out. You know, the interesting thing is I looked at the images that are all over the internet right now contrasting the Last Supper and then the mockery that we saw the other night. And it's interesting because all I could think about was Pastor Ben's message last week and the salt that was spilled right in front of Judas. And I thought to myself, look at the irony in the contrast that Jesus is being mocked by the world and yet Judas was invited to his Last Supper to sit at the table. Jesus hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. It's only by the grace of God and the spirit of God that you and I know the truth and are walking in it. So in this hour, would we be bold, but would we be humble? Would we walk like Jesus and love the lost? And I believe even today, today's message is gonna speak to you. And uh, I, I just came in here today, man. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna punch the devil in the throat because... <laughs> Yeah, he keeps trying to come at my family. And uh, I, just, I just feel compelled to say this because you know so many of you have showed our family so much love and support this week and, and I, I can't even get around to thanking all of you through the messages, the DMs, the texts, the, the generosity and we're just so grateful and thankful for your love and support. And some of you are like, what's going on? Well, Monday night, my I took my wife into the ER. She had an acute appendicitis that ended up rupturing. And so we spent the whole week in the hospital this week and just a lot of time to reflect. And it's, it's honestly, it's moments like this, y'all, that just remind me of the brevity of life. 
then in a moment, everything can shift. And I know that in a room this size, some of you have experienced uh, that this very week. You received the diagnosis. Something happened that just totally knocked you off course. But here's, here's what I came to declare today is that you and I can stand firm in the faith that Jesus, the rock, is our foundation, and when the winds of life come, I came in here to tell you that you don't have to get washed over, that you don't have to get bumped off course, but he keeps in perfect peace those whose minds stay fixed on him, and he's the author and finisher of our faith, and we are more than conquerors because of the one that lives in us, and I don't know about you, but in this hour, the enemy can intimidate me as much as he wants, but I'm not moving off my post. Is anybody with me? Is anybody with me, church? So I pray that just an impartation and a deposit would get in your spirit today. Man, this message isn't gonna be uh, all polished. If I'm really honest, I finished writing it this morning, hello? But uh, I do know this, that man, I'm thankful for Pastor Chuck Smith. I'll never forget it when I began studying the Bible. He said, simply teach the Bible simply. And today's story preaches. It really doesn't need me to, any commentary from me. Uh, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 15. I love this verse of scripture. By the way, can we honor Pastor Todd and Denise back off sabbatical in the room today? Come on, love them. I love it they're back in the room and we're, we're thankful for your leadership and gosh, what a, what a journey it's been. So crazy. Um, Luke chapter 15. I'm gonna read just a couple verses and then pray just to give us context here. Luke chapter 15. Um, this is one of four gospels. Our writer is Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke. And um, we're, we're, we're just at the portion of scripture in this particular gospel where we're seeing Jesus do a lot of miracles and ministry and man, things are starting to be stirred up and Jesus is eating and sitting with tax collectors and sinners and all the Pharisees and scribes and religious people of the day are kind of crossing their arms and looking at Jesus cross-eyed and asking a lot of questions. And that's a little bit of context of this chapter. I wanna just give you some context here. It says this in chapter 15, starting in verse one, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray that today that you would um, just illuminate a truth that you would speak to us in the next few moments that we have here. And uh, just so honored for what you're gonna do this morning. We're thankful that we can gather together freely, and we pray you a bless this time in Jesus' name, amen. So you can see the context here is the, uh, these religious people are really questioning Jesus, and they're asking him, man, like, why are you hanging out with, with all these lost people? And, you know, it's interesting because we have context of the full, of the full Bible, and so I have a little bit of grace for for them in that particular moment, you, you have to imagine that there was a way in which they were, tr were trained, there's a way in which things were done for, for years. And then Jesus shows up on the set and, and shifts everything. And you and I, we, we know what Jesus' mission was and he lays it out for us in Luke 19.10. It says this, the son of man came to what? To seek and to save that which is lost. That was his mission to seek and save the lost. News flash in here, before you were found, you were lost. Hello. And um, have you ever had something valuable that you've lost? Have you ever lost anything valuable? What are some things that are, that are valuable that you've lost? Wallet, yes. When you lose your wallet, right, you lose your wallet and you gotta be somewhere. Have you ever just, just scrambled through the house and just tore it all up, right? Anybody, phone, yes, phone, my goodness. What would we do without this thing in the back pocket? Holy smoke, what did we do before phones? My goodness. Any, anybody lost a wedding ring? You wanna admit in church, I see some hands go up. 
Oh, boy. Now, now let me ask you this question. Um, those of you that lost something valuable and then found it, what did you feel when you found it? Relief. Relief. Joy. Yes, there's something, there's something really um, satisfying about finding something that is lost. And it's funny, because as I was preparing for this, um, I, thought of, I thought of one of my little neighbors. He's one of my favorite little guys. I just, I love this little guy, he's the man. And he'll, he'll, he'll just roll over to the house. Um, we might as well just have one house with like a tunnel, right? Am I with you to the chats? And uh, my dog, Quinn, I love, Quinn, Quinn is the man. Quinn is the man, and he's, he's got this stuffed animal named Paul. Don't you play with Paul. I'll get between you and him if you want to mess with Paul. I'm telling you now. Because if Paul goes missing, we're going to have a travesty on our hands. Is anybody with me, huh? And uh, there's been a couple moments where he's left Paul at our house. And, you know, it's just a, everybody's looking for Paul. It's like sound the alarm when Paul is missing. <laughs> and, uh, man, whenever we find Paul and return it to little Quinny, he just, that, that little shuffle, man, and like the squeeze and the hug, I mean, it is... The joy when something is lost and then it's found. And you know, today I just, all week long as I've been reading the parables in Luke chapter 15, well really there's three different parables, we're gonna look at the prodigal son, but you see the, you see the, the shepherd go after the one sheep, so he leaves the 99 for the one lost sheep, or the woman that loses the coin, and. And, and really what's interesting is there's, there's a parallel between all three of these parables that the premise of all of these parables is the joy of our Savior, of our Father, of King Jesus when one sinner is found. Is anybody with me today? There's so much joy. And, it, and we, we even read about it in Luke chapter 15, verse 7. It says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. That's why at the end of this encounter and at the end of this encounter, you're gonna get an opportunity to make peace with God. That, that's why, th just so we know, that that's serious business. And I understand that, you know, there's some of you in the room, you're like, this guy's been talking way too long, and so you're, I see it, you know, I go to, go, we, we go into that moment, and some of y'all are bouncing, but that moment is so important because we get to partner with heaven in, in the greatest work, in what Jesus came to do. He came to seek and save that which is lost, and so when we, when we applause at the end here, we're, we're agreeing with heaven. We're rejoicing with heaven. We're doing heavenly business in the house of God. Are you with me today? And this is, this is what we see, and we're gonna see it in this particular text. And to set some context to this parable that Jesus is going to share, we see a father and his two sons. And um, you're gonna see here that uh, one son, uh, one son goes, goes off the rails. The other son is close in proximity, but finds his way off the rails as well, and you're gonna, you're gonna catch that here. I think it's really interesting, but let's, let's check this out, and if you're a note taker here, you can write down uh, the first point. It's rebellion, rebellion. Starting in verse 11, it says this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, here it is, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So you can see here he's requesting his inheritance before his father even dies. Can you imagine what the father must have felt, the disrespect in this particular moment, the lack of honor? What's interesting is so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. You know what's interesting? I think this is just a really good parenting tip and also a really good picture of who God the father is. God is not strong-arming strong any of you into relationship with him. And we say this all the time, why? Because you can't have true love without free will, choice. You know, you know so often we, you know, we, we try to helicopter over our kids and make the decisions for them, and I just see here that the, this father's like, okay, that's what you want, I'm gonna give you what you want. 
Because sometimes when we give our kids what they want, it's through that process that they actually discover what they really need. And so in this particular moment, we see this rebellion that's rising up. And by the way, might I say that only by the spirit of God and the grace of God are you and I not in rebellion towards God. So in other, in other words, being separated from him or apart from him or coming and surrendering to him daily, but just, just by the nature, the sin nature that is in each of us, we're all drifting towards rebellion. So, so that's for those of you that, that aren't in Christ, but that's for those of you that are in Christ. You gotta die daily, pick up your cross daily. You gotta surrender daily to following him. Is anybody with me in here today? So you can see here he's requesting that this estate be split up. So his father agrees to divide the wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money and wild living. Now, for context here, what you need to understand is that when, when an inheritance was divided amongst two sons, the first son was gonna get half of the wealth, and then the, the second son was gonna get a half of a half. So really, what he was receiving was a third of the estate here. Now, what's interesting about these three parables, and I know we didn't read the first two, so you'll have to go back and do some homework, but if the sheep that was lost in the first parable, uh, that represents foolishness, and the coin represents carelessness, the son was lost because of willfulness. Willfulness. It, it was his choice. The, before he ever entered into the distant land, it, the distant land was in his heart. He wasn't content where he was. He was coveting something that he didn't have. He wanted to have his own way, so he rebelled against his own father and broke his father's heart. Now, to illustrate this a little bit further, anybody in here have kids? Any, any, any parents in the room? Any parents in the room? Did you have to teach your kids how to be selfish? <laughs> oh, quit acting like your kids aren't selfish. They came out the womb shouting, mine, 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 mine. This, the, Hello, somebody, we need to wake up to the problem. The sin nature and rebellion is burst in us. It's already there. So can we just all agree the playing field, right? Rebellion's in us. I don't have to convince anybody in here that you're drifting towards rebellion. It's very clear that we come out drifting towards rebellion. I love what Thomas Huxley said. He said this, a man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do just as he likes. Mm. Now, when we read this section on rebellion, when you hear the phrase distant land, you shouldn't think of a place halfway around the world because a distant land is one step outside of God's will. Hello, somebody. You don't need to be in Vegas in order to be in rebellion towards God. Some of you are in church today, but you are in a distant land in your heart. How do we end up in a distant land? We get self-consumed. We cut ourselves off from the grace of God and the spirit of God. And we say, I'm good, Yahweh. I wanna have it my way. Whoa. This is how we begin to walk in rebellion. And each of us has the capacity to do this. Now, Proverbs 20, 21 says this, an inheritance gained hurriedly at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. His demand for his inheritance early was a perversion of privilege and it wouldn't be blessed in the end. Which leads us to the next point that you can write down, the result. So here's the result of rebellion. Let's check it out in verse 14. It says, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. Somebody say starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. How tragic, right? The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. It's, it's, it's really such a tragic picture because when he left his father's house, he was cut off from the source. He went to a distant land with a bucket of water when he could have stayed by the well. 
How many of you know that when you and I go trying to drink out of other, any other well other than his well, when we, when we try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in any other well than Jesus' well, how many of you know that it's always going to lead us to a place of spiritual famine? That's always going to be the result. And it might not happen in year one or two or three or four, but it might happen four decades down the line. Here's, here's what I want to tell somebody today is that when you make the choice to live in rebellion, Satan doesn't want you to consider what is at the end of the road. Do, do you think that if this boy could envision where this pathway would actually take him, do we believe that he actually would have taken it? Probably not. But here he finds himself at the end of his road in embarrassment and shame. We're talking about a Jewish boy that's going to work in a pig pen. Now, I believe that what's so interesting about this parable, I believe one of the greatest short stories that's ever been written. And the beautiful thing about a parable is the power of a parable is the power of the story because the power of the story becomes a metaphor for our own lives. That's why we say the word of God is like a mirror. Why do you think we're so passionate about you becoming a self-feeder? Because when you read the word, the word reads you. And all of us can think about a season in our life or maybe you find yourself in that season today where you were in rebellion to God and you found yourself in the pig pen of life. Is anybody with me today? Can you picture that place? Can you picture what you felt in that place? Can you picture the embarrassment, the shame, the pain, the hurt, the fear? This, This is where this boy is at. And it reminds me of this quote that sin will take you further than you ever wanted to stray. It'll cost you more than you ever dreamed you could pay. And it'll keep you longer than you ever thought you would stay. But like this young boy, some of you have hit rock bottom. And it's painful and it's embarrassing and it hurts. But this is what it took for you to look up. So you came into church today and you're at rock bottom. I'm just here to say I know it hurts but you're having a collision with the divine today. And it's when you and I hit rock bottom that we learn that Jesus is the bedrock that we can rebuild our life upon. Is anybody with me in here today? Come on, put your hands together if you've experienced that in your own life. You've hit rock bottom, but you've experienced that Jesus is the rock in which you can build your life upon. For some of us, it takes humiliation to produce humility. Is anybody with me today? divine disruptions that hurt, but that are the catalysts that produce healing in our life. And that's what's happening here. He's got no money, no food. He's, he's got a job and a pig pen. This is the result of rebellion. But what's so interesting is this, this, this result produced a realization. And that's what's happening in the room today for some of you, that, that you've been walking in rebellion towards God And there's a particular area of your life where you're experiencing famine and you don't like the result and the result is is not comfortable and it's embarrassing and and it's hard to deal with, but it's in these very moments that we have the divine realization that turns everything around. Are you ready to see it in scripture? Here it is. In verse 17, it says this, when he finally came to his senses. Ooh, that phrase right there is the phrase that just stuck out all week long. When he finally came came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. When he came to his senses, Here's what I know about sin is sin is senseless. Sin is a form of temporary spiritual insanity. But oftentimes, the sin produces a result in our life that causes us to actually wake up to the reality of the trajectory of our life. Has anybody experienced that in here? Isn't it amazing how the growl of a stomach gets our attention like the roar of a lion? God has a way of speaking to our hearts when we're hungry, 
when we're hurting, when we're helpless, when we're hapless, when we're homeless. I don't know what the case is, but there are seasons in our life where finally the light bulb goes off. I think about my own life, and you guys have heard the story, but in 2007, sitting in a Hollywood video parking lot, and it was about three years of situations where God was trying to get my attention. I found myself in the darkest season of my life, making decisions that I never thought I would make, experiencing the the rottenness of those decisions. How many of you know that sin is fun for a season, but that fun runs out real quick, doesn't it? It's, It's like, you know, hey, the first time you get high, it might feel good, but then guess what? When you're going broke because of the addiction five years later, when you find yourself on a concrete floor in prison because of that addiction, it ain't so cool anymore. Is anybody with me? See, I I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, in the way that Satan has deceived your imagination to see what the, the future trajectory of your life looks like on this path, I pray right now that the Spirit would wake you up and actually give you a picture before you get to the picture that you wouldn't have to experience the pain. But right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he would wake you up and say, son, daughter, you don't wanna go in that direction. You can avoid the pig pen in the house of God today. Is anybody with me? It doesn't have to be your portion. It doesn't have to be your portion. And I even just wanna speak uh, for a second now to some of my folks that were raised up in the faith. There's no shame for your testimony. You don't need to go off the rails to be used by God. My goodness, can we get a generation of people that are raised up that stay pure and stay, man, that God is raising up a generation that would be the next generation of church leaders that would call this generation back to holiness? Come on, is anybody with me in here today? I hear it. I hear young people that, man, that's not my, you know, we celebrate the broken stories and those that are far and those that were gone and those, and that's what's happening here with the prodigal. But what, what, what you need to understand is that, hey, listen, all of us, whether you grow up in the church or you're far from God, it doesn't really matter. Proximity isn't the key, and you're going to see it here with the older brother. Because just like I said, you can be in church today, but be in a distant land in your heart. The Father's love is the only thing that will fulfill and satisfy. And we see here that in this this hurting season, he has this realization that, oh my goodness, I had it way better back home. That's why I love what the Bible says. It says that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. The goodness of God. You're also gonna see here that, that, that a realization, a realization It can't stop with a realization. A realization without movement in a new direction is just remorse. And there's a lot of people that are just stuck in remorse, that are just stuck in shame. I'm here to declare today that it's gonna require a a, a new way of thinking, a new direction in your life. And the Bible calls it what? Repentance. That's what it leads to here. So he has this realization That then leads to repentance. Check it out, verse 20. So he returned home to his father. He didn't just have the realization and just sit in the realization, but it was the realization that that produced repentance in his life. Now let me pause here for a second because we talked about it a little bit earlier. And uh, I just think, man, right now, I want you to know that if if you're a parent, a grandparent in this place, an aunt or an uncle, if you've got a family member that would fall into the category of prodigal, man, I feel for you. That takes an immense amount of trust to keep your hand open to trust God in that particular situation. But here's here's what I want us to catch. Because in the first two parables in Luke chapter 15, we see the shepherd go after the lost sheep. We see the woman go after the coin. But in this instance, we don't see the father go chase after his kid that is off in the deep end. I think so often we, we have children and kids and grandkids that never have the realization because you're always stepping in and saving them from the revelation that God wants to give them when they're in the pit. 
Don't prohibit God's work in their life. Trust him because it's actually going to produce the repentance in their life. They've got a taste that the fruit is rotten before they'll go back to the father's house. Is anybody with me in here today? This is what happens. He goes back and you see it even in his confession. Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. Godly sorrow leads men to repentance. Not remorse, but godly sorrow. I've sinned against heaven and you and I'm, I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. What's so interesting is we see here the father's response and this is really why I titled this message The Father's Love because there's somebody in here that needs to hear this this morning that you're never too far gone for God's love. Yeah. You've, you've never drifted too far. You, you've never gone too far off the deep end for God's love to, to catch you up, to, to, to capture you, to, to take you on a whole new trajectory in your life. Has anybody experienced that in the room today? Yeah. Check it out in verse 22. I've called this rejoicing. But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So let the party begin. And it's so interesting when I read this. And you can imagine, remember context here, Jesus is telling these parables to a bunch of Pharisee and scribes. And they're probably thinking as this parable is being told like, Around every turn is another unexpected action by this father. Like, it's interesting, and, I, and, I de and I'm de gonna declare this over somebody's life in here today, that the farther you go, the longer he's waiting. The father was waiting, and at the glimpse of his son returning, what did he do? He went to run after him. It's interesting because in Deuteronomy, that sort of behavior from a son had grounds for being stoned. And one commentary wrote that the father ran out to the son because if the neighbors wanted to stone him, they were gonna have to stone the father. What a picture of God's grace. What a picture of what Jesus has done for you and I. I mean, look at the rejoicing here as his son returns. It's like my boy Quinn, when he gets Paul back, he's hyped. So much joy. And you see the joy of the father here. And I love what each of these things that he gives to his son, what they represent. The kiss is a sign of forgiveness. The robe is a sign of honor. The ring is a sign of receiving his name back. It's a sign of authority and it's a sign of access. I wanna tell you something about the ring. Oftentimes the ring, it was like the credit card before the credit card it would represent the family name, and so then when the kid was wearing the ring and went out and wanted to make a purchase, he would put the ring into some wax, and guess what? The father's account would get billed for that wax. Hello, somebody. We're talking about the source, the well that never runs dry. The feast, the feast was a sign of a joyful welcome. A joyful welcome. So we see this here, but then it's interesting because now the story takes a turn. And, and there's some of you that to this point, you're like, I'm in a season where I can't really, I can't, it doesn't really resonate where that, that first son is at. But I think that this is a word for all of us that have been walking with Jesus for a while. Check it out. This is called rejection, verse 25. Check it out. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And there's some of us that we just haven't figured this out yet. You were saved by grace and grace alone, and yet you still have the mindset that you've gotta work for God's love. You've gotta work for his love. I gotta do some stuff. I gotta do some stuff. I gotta work for his love. I gotta earn his favor. I gotta earn it. And that's where this, this brother's at. He's out in the field and he's working. Somebody say working. working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what was going on? And the servant said, your brother's back. He was told, and your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, 
See that? The father went to him. He's begging him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all the time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours came back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Verse 31. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. The proud and self-righteous always feel that they are not treated as well as they deserve. What's so interesting is I think Jesus finished with this parable to really just stick it to the Pharisees in like the kindest way ever. Because just like the Pharisees, the older brother was defining sin by outward actions, not inward attitudes. So, so we see here that, you know, as, I, as I've just kind of been processing through this parable, there's, there's this... I think there's a scripture I wanna give you as our final takeaway here. Luke 12, 15, write this down. Jesus, in, in this particular text, he's warning two disputing brothers, and he's saying this, take heed and beware of covetousness. A coveting heart will take you to a distant land, even if that's just one side, step outside of God's will. A person who is coveting can never be satisfied, no matter how much he or she acquires. And here's, this is gonna be my final statement of, of today's message. Because in both cases, this was it. The younger brother wanted something before the season had come. And we don't know this for certain, but he was obviously coveting being in a place that he wasn't in. Then he comes back, and the older brother is coveting what he never received. Whenever we covet, we never experience contentment. And a dissatisfied heart always leads to a disappointed life. Hello, somebody. But a satisfied heart leads to a supernatural life. And I think that that's what, the, what God would want us to receive today. That, that, that God would want us to reflect on today is that where are we going to look for our love? Because fulfillment and satisfaction is found only in the Father's house. It's found only in relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know some of you theologians, are, you're, you're already thinking in your head, but, but we didn't talk about the cross in this story. And yes, this parable isn't perfectly theologically sound, but it's just a parable, right? And so this is the point in the encounter where we get to say, think about this, in our context, there comes a point in our life where we have the realization that we're talking about. We come to the recognition that we've sinned against the holy God, that we've taken this life, the gift of life that God has given us, and we've said, God, thank you, I've got it from here. I'm not gonna go Yahweh, I'm gonna go my way. And just like this little brother, we go off into a distant land until we come to a place of famine, spiritual famine, a moment where the Holy Spirit wakes us up to the reality of where we're at and we're faced with a decision. And the decision that we're faced with is either we're gonna keep going our own way or we're gonna surrender and we're gonna receive the grace of God. See, is anybody in the house thankful that there was a pathway made forward back to the Father through the perfect Son, Jesus Christ? Jesus left heaven and came to earth he lived the life that you and I couldn't. And he went to that cross to pay for our penalty, to pay for that separation, to pay for that debt. And Pastor Ben said it last week, it wasn't the nails that kept him there, it was his love for you and I. And as he hung on that cross, he, he made a bridge back to right relationship with the God who made us, with the God who knows us, with the God that has a purpose for your life. Is anybody with me in here today? Jesus made the way. And all you have to do is receive the free gift. I think about the moment in my own life when I made that decision and everything changed. 
I believe that in a room this size, there are some of you that your, your thought in this moment is he read my mail today. And I wanna tell you that there is no shame, there's no amount of remorse, there's a no amount of time that's gonna cause you to feel differently than you feel today. Do not harden your heart to the Spirit's invitation to come back home today. And just like the Father ran off to his son, this place is gonna erupt today when you come back to Jesus today. Are you with me in here today? So I want to stand, I want us to stand to our feet. If today is the day that you need to repent and turn to God, that you need to ask for his forgiveness and you need to begin walking out the relationship that he created you for all along, the band's gonna play and I want you to make your way forward and it's gonna be my privilege to lead you in this prayer today. Church, be praying right now. Be praying, and if I'm speaking to you, make your way forward. Come on.